Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio news magazine that we put together here at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy so that you can enter into whatever conversations crop up around you, uh, well informed with some very, very deeply embedded uh, facts and information uh, for that. And I imagine our first guest is going to probably generate more of those conversations than uh, many of our other ones uh, as well this morning. Uh, because uh, joining us uh, from uh, his office and uh, fresh from uh, writing a very stinging rebuke uh, in the um uh, in the uh, midterm is Ambassador Francis Rooney, former uh, representative of Florida. Uh, and you can read his uh, piece at the Hill uh, there as well. Ambassador, thank you for joining us. How are you doing, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it, you know, and, and many people dance around the subject that you uh, went right into. And there was the midterms of 2022, uh, the the achievements not reached, uh, the red wave, uh, red tsunami, as many in the media characterized it uh, as uh, uh, not achieved uh, there as well. And you point directly to your uh, neighbor there in Palm Springs, uh, Florida, former President Trump. Trump uh, as uh, uh, much of the Republicans re- problem with uh, uh, achieving that red tsunami. We, you know, how long has this feeling been percolating? Was it uh, was it something that as you watch the election results come in or uh, had this been a thought for some time and you finally started to see some statistics to point to uh, to make your case? Well, I think that it's been building for a long time. I mean, there's been so much disruption, certainly as we got towards the uh, the 22 election, and uh, the partisanship continues to increase. The, the Congress is less and less able to deal with any kind of hard subject. I mean, they're pretty good at naming post offices <laughs> and having commemorations of dead veterans or something, but they aren't very good at dealing with immigration, China, uh, uh, tax policy, and spending. Where and and I I've talked to many other former members of the House uh, who have pointed to a lot of things that go on institutionally in the House that have been uh, party building rather than coalition building behaviors. The the you know the fundraising totals you have to achieve to get to seats and committees and things like that. Uh, so as is, are do those also tend to lead to the partisanship more than, uh, you know, even uh, the idea that the the Republican Party is a one person party? It um, I think the fundraising and the partisan districts are two really problematic Mm. areas in in terms of the sorting out the kind of quality Congress people we get and the kind of ability of uh, elected officials to reach across the aisle and get something done. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, at Clinton's at the end of Clinton's second term, 26 percent of the 434 districts were considered partisan. Now it's like 80. So the election doesn't really count in the general election, but really counts as these primaries. I'm going to stick a pin in that because that's I've said something very controversial about Virginia's redistricting this past uh, census uh, <clears throat> that a lot of a lot of the listeners at first blush don't agree with me uh, with. But uh, at least the outcome, maybe we did a bad thing that came out good. I'm not sure or did it in a bad way, but I, but I want to stick a pin in that idea of competitive districts uh, there, uh, Ambassador Rooney. So uh, talk about the the impact and and the the weight the gravity that president trump uh, carries in the republican party and how you feel as your column lays out very well in the hill here uh, that it's it, it's pushing more of this partisanship um, than than is healthy for the republican or the conservative mind well it's hard to say you know we we uh the, the Trump phenomenon has upended a lot of things, and it was coming anyway. It's not fair to blame Trump for it. I mean, mm-hmm. this whole shift of the party to populism, uh, anti-corporate, anti-capitalism, the the change in the demographics of Republicans versus Democrats, the split between the middle of the country and the so-called uh, coastal elites. There's just a lot of stuff kind of coming unglued mm-hmm. around here that's coalescing around how does the government function. 
You know, and I see, I hear a lot of the things that I see wrong in campaigns. You know, where you you focus group, you you drive out the base, uh, you you spend most of your time, and I and I say it, and I I face palm because you you specifically bring up Ron DeSantis and Glenn Youngkin, and Virginia's yeah. governor certainly went out, and you saw even in areas like our our flagship area of Charlottesville with a five to seven percent increase over the regular you know. Republican vote totals uh, in a state that doesn't register by party. So it's kind of a moving target to know for sure. But most polling has the state at about 40 percent Democrat self-identified and then uh, 30-30 Republican and independent self-identified. So, you know, those kind of gains are notable because these were people that uh, over the last two or three gubernatorial races had voted for Democrats. Yeah. Yeah, it's all changing around. So so what is the message to that? I mean, certainly in Glenn Youngkin's case, it was the issue of parents and their authority well, and their yeah, family. I think was Governor Youngkin carved out some tremendously important territory in Loudoun County when he backed those mothers and, and realized how how far awry our uh, mm-hmm. secondary education system probably are university system too, but certainly our high school and grade school systems are nowadays. And and now that movement has spread around the country. Uh, Ron DeSantis has picked it up, Greg Abbott, Christy uh, Neem, and a lot of other Republican governors. But I tell you, Governor Governor Youngkin, Youngkin was the first guy to realize the magnitude of the problem. Now, there were many people involved in the Yunkin campaign that have confessed to me that uh, this was very controversial within the campaign and that uh, he nearly lost uh, many of his key consultants who were absolutely sure that going after this was going to be a loser uh, for the governor. Uh, and maybe maybe just in raw data or consultant speak, it would be uh, he, he maybe just did it better than the, your average Republican might. Uh, but but I think sometimes our reliance on people who uh, just are, you know, rehashing the the same things that worked in the last election is is part of our problem as conservatives. Is that we're 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 staying away from poverty. I, I looked at the uh, straw polls from the last two CPAC conferences, and the lowest ranking uh, issue amongst the attendees of CPAC with one percent of the uh, straw poll vote each time was poverty. And I said, this is why we lose all the time because poverty is a winning issue for uh, Democrats. They come in and just say, we'll send we'll send some more subsidy checks to you uh, and they get enough votes to get to 51 uh, percent. Conservatives need to roll up their sleeves and start looking at issues like Glenn Youngkin said. What do you think of that? Um, uh, well, I ambassador? think you're absolutely right. You know, we, we have to be the people that can offer solutions to all the different kind of problems, not just the ones that we historically have wanted to fool with. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Ronald Reagan was one of the greatest employment generators there ever was by turning the economy around, killing off inflation. And he started basically a 20 plus year run of, of really good uh, productivity increases and, and employment increases and business increases in the United States. Mm-hmm. When you look at that and you look at the, you know, lifting the government off the back of you know, that's another thing the government, the, the conservatives have not done a great job with. I've looked at a lot of the congressional races around here, and I think the dynamic of just labeling the economy as bad and President Biden slash your congressional opponents uh, inflation wasn't enough. You know, the, that the people who said, OK, and here's how I'm going to fix said, here's what I'm going to do for the inner cities like Ron DeSantis did. Ron DeSantis has helped lead to a conservative revival in Miami, Dade County, uh, uh, Ambassador. Yeah, and, and there's a little little more to that you need to understand, too. The uh, he, I, I agree with what Governor DeSantis has done. In fact, there were many black mothers that wrote in and said, we supported Governor DeSantis because he is for pro-choice, and we want our kids to go to a good school, too, not one that's encumbered with the teachers' union sclerosis. Mm-hmm. But there there were 300,000 more votes cast, Republican votes cast in Dade County than there ever had been before. And I think that's because of Dor- Doral, which has become almost 100 percent Venezuelan immigrants. And these are successful people in, that had to leave their country because their country's really de- deteriorated horribly. And they're successful people and they'll be successful people here. And they're conservative and they know what tyranny is. So they, they vote Republican. 
I think many of the uh, places in Florida, you know, but have been ignored by conservatives because uh, it wasn't the base, though. And that's kind of what I was getting at, is that conservatives can win these issues if they roll up their sleeves and and in many ways, you know, eschew the the traditional, uh, you know, uh, rhetoric that you hear in a campaign and especially seem to cripple some of the ones in the midterms. Don't you think, Ambassador Bernie? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I do. So and we need we we need a call to detone the rhetoric and focus on substance on all sides here. And the, the American people need to hold all these guys accountable for that. Is it hard to you know, make that argument when it's been so long uh, that that fewer and fewer people, especially in the younger demographics, can recall a time when there was, you know, conservative leadership. I mean, the, even the last Republican president was was dominated by the, the beginnings of the war on terror. Uh, and and people forget that, you know, the number of he's not my president bumper stickers that populated the country prior to September 11th. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And unfortunately, a lot of President Bush's agenda got hijacked mm-hmm. by the by 9-11 and the subsequent actions that they took. So so that's going to be the hardest case is going back, as you said, to Reagan and pointing to, you know, the, the lifting of regulation and the lifting of some of the government um, uh, programs uh, because it has been so long since anyone has seen it. What, what would be your suggestion to candidates uh, to find those to point to Florida, to point to Virginia, who, uh, you know, where yeah. we, we cut taxes and actually grew collections at the government level? You know, if you look at these so-called red states and now Virginia is kind of becoming one with a Republican, good, good Republican governor, uh, their performance vastly outperforms the, the hard blue states. I mean, you know, California, and Illinois and New York are on one side of the spectrum and Texas, Florida and Virginia is joining that club. are on the other side of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. When you look at and again, Governor Youngkin has made a great case of pointing to the tax cuts and 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 then applying the newest ones to small businesses to saying that, you know, tax breaks that are available for the bigger employers in Virginia should be available for the moms and the pops Uh, again, facing a year and change of unending negative rhetoric from the Democrats of Virginia, his approval rating is is moved into the mid 50s, uh, upper 50s. 50s, depending on the polls you look at. Um, so I, I, is that another lesson for those uh, conservatives that, uh, you know, get get the small businesses churning and you'll win? Well, I think statistics show how much business is done by small business versus big ones. It's mm-hmm. a lot more. And that's where a lot of our jobs are in this country. So it's kind of ridiculous that we don't do a better job of paying attention to them. You know, and the, the like the sub S situation mm-hmm. that, that the Republicans kind of screwed that up when they did the tax reform of 2017. But at the end, they put in a deduction that keeps sub S as a viable option. And almost all small businesses are sub X, mm-hmm. sub S. We're visiting with Ambassador Francis Rudy, former member of Congress, uh, author of an amazing piece uh, in The Hill, kind of going where a lot of people don't want to go, which is, uh, you know, the head into the lion. Uh, and I, I know a lot of President Trump's fans uh, will say, but look at the policies that the, the president, uh, you know, did. And, you know, there's the debate, you know, personality versus policy. Uh, is there weight to that or was this more about advisors or were there really good policy gains during President Trump's four years? I think it's kind of misleading to say how great Trump was because of what he did in, in light of all the baggage and, and the populism things that he brought to the, to the party. Any decent Republican would have had a killing field eliminating all the terrible things Obama put in place in eight years, all of the anti-employment things, the Labor Department changes, the wage and hour changes, the EPA, the Waters of the Americas. I mean, it was just like, let's throw all that stuff out. And we worked for two straight years. I was on the Education Committee Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to clean up Obama stuff. There was an argument made, you know, regarding Obamacare that the you know, the greatest hero for Obamacare was President Trump because Republicans uh, didn't want to give Donald Trump the ability to uh, undo Obamacare uh, more than they didn't want to get rid of Obamacare. Is there any validity to that statement? 
Um, you know, I would say the most the, the Obamacare thing was a big distraction. Mm-hmm. You know, if you look at the bill that we labored over, anguished over for almost two years, it wasn't much different than Obamacare when you got right down to the end of it. And it couldn't get passed either. Um, the American people want a lot of those things. You just got to face the, the fact. I mean, uh, I don't think it was necessarily done the best possible way. I think they could have done it and left more power to the states like Medicaid to, to deal with and not such a federal thing. Mm-hmm. But people want health care. I think a lot of people feel that health care is a right now. I, I don't necessarily agree with it myself, but that's what they think. Is there a, a an issue, you know, you, you talk about populism and, and I fight this fight on my local show as well here, uh, former uh, ambassador Rooney and former congressman Rooney, uh, that that you, it, it, it lends itself to the authoritarians, to the to the expansion of government to say, well, you know, I want the right to health care or I want the right to uh, dwelling or I want the right to transportation, um, because you, especially in light of the poverty that's created, uh, that's gripping a lot of our inner cities, I, I think, you know, most people would probably say, yeah, we look at a homelessness problem, affordability of housing problem. Uh, and and I don't know if government is the answer, but they certainly seem very good at saying that they will be at some point down the line. Yeah, they're pretty good at taking credit for stuff. And and I think there are problems. A lot of the, the problems with housing is it gets into all the red tape of getting subdivisions plotted. And, and then some of the uh, and it also drives up the price of land. There's a, we still have a lot of land in this country for people to build houses on if they want. Not mm-hmm. always in all the right places where the jobs are, but there's uh, there's a lot of opportunity to build mm-hmm. affordable housing in many places. And maybe the, there's a role for government to help maybe stimulate that a little bit because the returns maybe are not as great as other kinds of housing. I don't know. But clearly, we need to, we need to have less government red tape and more uh, – uh, less hindrance on business so that business can continue to drive the job growth in this country well, instead you, of the government. You talk about your work in the education field when you were in the House of Representatives, uh, Ambassador, and you know, one of the things that strikes me is that <clears throat> you look at the student loan debt issue, and that's one aspect of it. But the workforce development, uh, you know, we're still seeing that that middle class blue collar job being harder and harder to find that job where, uh, well, like Ted Lerner. Uh, you know, he 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 started his yeah. own company. Uh, just passed, just left us. Uh, you know, owner of the Nationals, yeah. but started with nothing. Put a couple hundred bucks together. Started a real estate uh, business, uh, and became the wealthiest man in D.C. in in the course of a lifetime. But that ability to go from poverty to wealth is is going away in this country, and I and I worry that that middle class bridge, you know, employment world uh, needs to come back. Is is that something the Republicans like Glenn Youngkin, Ron DeSantis, whoever winds up uh, being presidential candidate, but even Senate candidates, we're going to have a Senate race here in Virginia in 2024 as well, need to be talking about? I, I definitely do. I think that uh, we, we have to take the lead. And I was just talking to some people from the Cato Institute yesterday about that. They have some big programs going to help to to explain how our uh, mobility has deteriorated as the government has become all encroaching and people have lost a lot of their freedom to develop their own career and ability to develop their own career. I mean, how much harder is it to start a dress shop or a candy shop now than it was 30 years ago? Mm-hmm. Well, you talk about the you know, again it goes back to the real estate question. What is what is available? What storefronts are available, uh, and and what are the reg- what's the regulatory capture? I was talking to a builder who said it, it costs you know o- almost twenty thousand dollars just to get the shovel in the ground uh, to build a house. So you're immediately knocking a lot of people out of the affordability uh, realm there. And certainly, you know, if somebody building an individual home, you're not uh, seeing it there uh, either. Is there you? mentioned Ron DeSantis and uh, Glenn Youngkin. Um, is there a danger in what we're already seeing where uh, the media has characterized some of President Trump's uh, tweets uh, as attacks on DeSantis uh, and and Youngkin and that the party could be divided over this and, you know, kind of wander the wasteland for another few decades until it goes away? 
Well, I, I think until until you confront Trump, you know, we're not going to be moving towards a solution. So I'm glad that you've got people like Governor Yunkin and Governor DeSantis that are willing to speak up and say, hey, you know, we we, uh, we don't agree with Trump. And uh, that may provoke uh, Trump not to run, but it certainly will provoke some difference of opinion. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people down here really like Governor DeSantis. And I know a lot of people in Virginia where we spent half, we live in D.C. half our time, really like Governor Yunkin. They have shown, you know, uh, an ability to to govern as a conservative and and win over. Uh, I think Chap Peterson has been a Democrat that has spoken out eloquently on uh, positions that Governor Yunkin has taken and has stepped out uh, from behind the party. Uh, you know, last little bit for you, and and I really am fascinated because I'm not saying I want to get rid of the political parties, but uh, the power grip that they seem to have on their candidates uh, is it. it appears real. I talk to people who are inside saying, oh, no, the parties really don't have that much power. But then when these uh, elected officials get into office, they start parroting the party line like, you know, they have to. Otherwise, you know, they're going to be kicked off the island. Where is the power that I'm not catching uh, this authority over the party, over these uh, elected office holders uh, to, uh, what was it, Tip O'Neill once said, uh, you know, check your party affiliations at the door? Yeah, that was one of the things I found, uh, several things, but one of the things I found really uninspiring about being in Congress, this quest to conform and to do what the leadership says. I'm not really used to people telling me what to do, mm-hmm. especially not from a politician. And, you know, a lot of these guys just knuckle down and roll over and they just do whatever they're told to do and they raise whatever money they're told to raise. And what kind of life is that? <laughs> Not one I'd want. I'm telling you that right no. now. And, and 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 I feel like the American people don't get served very well by that kind of you know uh, ecosystem, do they? No, they don't. In fact, the whole system of money and partisanship and party control has tended to turn the Congress into mush. Everybody's so conservative about their taking positions and and and, and parting with leadership. All they want to do is keep their head down and keep their job, mm-hmm. and never alienate a voter at all. It's interesting because it seems to empower the unelected bureaucracy more, doesn't it? That uh, you know becomes just the, uh, the 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 function of the executive branch and their their directorate, EPA, department, you name it. Uh, they're all uh, sort of running the country while con- Congress is in absence. Now that is a separate subject that could merit an entire interview. But the whole encroachment of the executive branch on the other two branches of government has been going on since uh, since FDR. But in the last 20 years, it's taken a dramatic leap forward. There's some really bad concepts out there, some of which were created by Republicans, mm-hmm. like the unitary president theory, that whatever the president does is de facto correct. Or, mm-hmm. or these things that like Biden's doing and Obama did where they said, we know it's unconstitutional, but we're going to do it anyway. Yeah, go ahead you and know? bring I mean, us to court. And then you have this Chevron doctrine, which we tried to get repealed. I don't think we ever did. That says, basically, if you write a vague law, which Congress writes very vague laws, because it's all they can get agreement on, then the bureaucracy is entitled to interpret it however they want. Didn't the uh, How's that? didn't the uh, West Virginia uh, versus EPA case kind of blow that up where the Supreme Court said, no, there has to be specific language about it? I, I'm trying to remember how the, the uh, opinion was worded just in this last uh, session of the court. But you're right. I mean, it's just yeah, they'll they'll write a funding bill. And, and, and it really, I, I know Daniel Hannon uh, wrote a piece after the queen passed away saying that uh, America needed a constitutional monarchy. I said, well, what we really have is a democratically elected monarchy is we have a, a president yeah. who with the pen and the phone can j- just dictate to these agencies. Yeah. We have Lee Kuan Yew. It's just, he's elected, not picked. It's crazy. We need to fix yeah, it. We have an authoritarian government and they, they're increasing on individual rights and liberties every day. And the people don't seem to care. Look, I look on these colleges. They don't even care about any kind of differences of opinion. All they want is their opinion to carry the day, uh, regardless of what it may be. So what's the use of a university if you don't have differences of opinion? Why why don't you save your money? 
truth to that. Uh, Ambassador Rooney, it has been a joy meeting you, and uh, it is a wonderful column. I encourage everyone to go to the Hill and read it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there are many of you who are going to immediately bristle at some of the subject matter, but if you dig into it, it makes sense, and uh, hopefully that came through in our chat here this weekend. Thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up next from American Commitment, Phil Kirpin joins us on inflation and, and how much more money we have to spend before inflation starts coming down, he says with tongue in cheek. <laughs> 